Welcome to the Rainbow Room. Our podcast about writing, representation, and gay stuff. This is Rabbit, an interview with Kyle Prue, part two. At this point, we watch Rabbit. Rabbit is a for-hire human you can hire to do tasks that are usually too embarrassing or illegal for a normal task rabbit. Rabbit is sent by his distributor, Dispatch, to Bobby. Bobby has hired Rabbit to pretend to be his boyfriend for a dinner date with the girl that he likes named Maxine. He has been pretending to be gay for Maxine the last 10 years. Rabbit, annoyed with the premise, goes along, almost too well that Bobby is sometimes perturbed at how gay he is being. Later in the dinner, they run out of wine, and Maxine invites rabbit to go with her to pick up some more. On their walk, Maxine reveals that she knows Bobby's secret. When asked why he does this, rabbit responds that he is a recovering addict. When asked about his sexual persuasion, rabbit reveals that he is asexual. Rabbit confronts Maxine, saying that she is keeping Bobby like a pet, but Maxine says that the love between her and Bobby is non-sexual the way that rabbit loves people. They return, Maxine leaves, and Bobby congratulates rabbit on doing such a good job. Rabbit puts on his gloves and leaves, deciding not to tell Bobby Maxine scene secret. And we just finished watching uh, <laughs> Eric is applauding. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I have so many thoughts. <laughs> uh, um, I know there's a lot of stuff- things that no that nobody's noticed yet. Sure, yeah, let's just do it do it right off the top. I'm, I'm curious. What are some of the things that no one's noticed? Well, so, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, well, actually, let me, I'm going to rewind and I'm just going to pitch this. Uh, yes, go for it. So when we were, before you, we watched, before we watched this, Kyle mentioned that there are some things that he's excited to talk about because no one's picked up on them yet. So Kyle, walk us through, what are some of these uh, things that no one's noticed? So it's very interesting because Bobby as a character is, is a villain. Like he is, he is, he, I like we sort of see him that way and when we cast Ted we were like people are gonna hate you for this role. <laughs> um, but the thing that we always had to constantly remind ourselves of is the fact that like Bobby is straight but has been doing has been pretending to be gay for so long so everything about him is something that a straight person thinks a gay person would do <laughs> so like so like whenever we were meeting with ted and we were meeting with the production designer you know when he says like oh i read the literature if you see that is the back such a wall, funny line <laughs> if you see the back wall when he's like walking to the door there's like a harry styles fine line record on the wall i noticed that i clocked that <laughs> hell yeah hell yeah our thought was like we're like we're like if like a character as sort of inept and as bobby like bobby would be like oh okay people love harry styles the other thing to, is to that be fair, he, Eric does. Eric is the biggest Harry Styles fan. <laughs> when that I mean, scene came on, I go, okay, I see him. <laughs> yeah, he uh I wish also, I had commented on it in the moment. This is hard to see, so I get why nobody said this. His charcuterie board is all meat. There's nothing else on like meat and apples. Like it was funny because our production designer Taylor was like, I wanted to give him the worst possible charcuterie board in the world. <laughs> and then the that other so thing funny. that nobody's noticed is, um, you know, Wait, I, we I'll, made. Go ahead. As I say, I want to say a minor thing that I noticed, and maybe someone already has picked up on this, but like the the moment with the mousetrap game, where like something yeah. has just happened, is that one of them? Yes, that's what I was gonna say. Nobody has commented I knew on it. it. Oh, I'm so glad but, I interrupted you to say it first. I didn't notice but, it until this watch through, maybe because I was like watching for that stuff. Yeah. So nobody, when I wrote it into the script, the production designer was like, "Does it have to be mousetrap? I can't find it." And I was like, "I would appreciate it if it is, because like Bobby is the mouse." And then, like, in Not Kissing Rabbit, in that moment, he's, like, trapping himself. And that's why, the, like, the thing comes down on the mouse. Um, it's such good like, symbolism. Because everyone was like, oh, like, let's do Django or whatever. And I was like, I guess we could do Django. Like, that's kind of is, like, similar in a way. Like, it's all falling apart. But, like, I really wanted Mousetrap. And the fact that we got it in there was, like, I felt, like, very lucky about. Also, Django would have been, like, so over the top, like, on the yeah. nose. And the mousetrap no, moment we, is really we, subtle. We would have had to reset it every time, too, which would have been a humongous nightmare. <laughs> yeah, that would have sucked. Yeah, but those, uh, those were sort of our big, our big little, like, Easter eggs, I think. But I, I think you're the first person to be like, oh, mousetrap is, is you know, hey. is a symbolic choice. And Eric clocked the Harry Styles, but neither of us clocked the... What was the other one? The third one? The charcuterie board is just, oh, like, aggressively awful. 
I didn't know uh, if the I didn't know if the scene when she takes your character like as they're about to leave for the shop how your wine was like completely full that was something that I was like what's going on here I didn't know if that was oh like, yeah the choice of the character or not yeah yeah like rabbit just like not even touching the glass <laughs> it um, is it is really funny that he says why don't you top me off <laughs> and it's grape juice. yeah it's from pomegranate juice yeah the other thing is like it's interesting like the first thing Bobby says is an objectively like horrible thing to say when he's like, I don't drink. And he's like, oh, it's a wine night. So I'd prefer if you did. <laughs> it's like crazy over the line. Um, but yeah, I, I think like the nice thing about having Ted is Ted plays that character with such like specificity and such nuance. Um, and it's interesting, like you really do like, I think a lot of people do hate Bobby. I think it's like Bobby uh, is definitely- I wanna, I wanna get into that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so um, actually let's let's talk big picture before we go into yeah. like more, continue going to the specifics, just of kind of like what we thought. Eric, this is your first time seeing it. What was, give us your thoughts, big picture thoughts. I just, like the layers that you kept like unveiling in each scene, mm. like, like it starts out as like such a question of like, like the very first scene, it's the question of the sexuality, and then you you learn that the guy is not even gay, and it's just like so many layers kept unfolding that I was like, uh, uh, like I was like, it was just so, yeah, I had a really great time, and yeah, no, I it was really nice, and I um, I really enjoyed. I guess maybe we'll all save this for when we get more into specifics. Yeah, <clears throat> for me. First of all, this this episode is incredible. I just, it's so funny. It's so tastefully done. It's written from such an informed point of view when it's talking about these people pretending to be gay. And also it's like, it's funny, but it also gets like really deep at some points and, and very um, captivating. And I, Kyle, I like find myself, I remember I was like taking a shower one night and I was just kind of like in the shower stopping thinking of like, what would I do in that situation? Uh, because the choice that the character has to make of does he interfere is just so when there's like there's a couple moments where I think are big like character almost twists in the way you see the character because you're right Bobby is so uh, Ted does an amazing job at playing him I'm getting that right Ted plays Bobby yeah okay yeah Ted Gibson Ted, Ted Gibson does such amazing job of playing him and he's playing him with such bravado but then there's that moment where like um he's like hey i really care about this person and it's it's funny because even in saying that he like <laughs> says like i deserve some credit here like which is a douchey thing yeah. to say but at the same time it's like so heartfelt and you can see that he like really does care and you start to like this character that you've built up to be so awful and hated you suddenly like have some he has more depth and you actually start to care about him and it's like such a cool it's so much better than a 2d villain and so then when you learn that she is like lying to him and knows his secret ah, and that that line where she's like hey you've been here one night i've been here 10 years it's a pretty good sell to be like stay out of this because it's like whoa she knows the situation better but it's just such a yeah uh, it's, it's interesting because when we when we got all these actors together what we would say is we'd ask them okay like think about your character who do they hope they are and who do they fear they are and like oh. mentally, I need you to ping pong between those two thoughts. So for Ted, Bobby hopes that he is a knight in shining armor, that this is all so romantic. This is the most romantic thing a man can do. Um, and Bobby fears that he is, he is a detestable creep. And so that's why he says to the rabbit, like, I can see you looking at me like I'm a creep. And that's sort of like what Bobby fears he is. And this is sort of his last dish effort to be like, like, this is an altruistic thing that I'm doing. Like, he's like, I just like her. And it's interesting because we, we, we had the concept for this episode. We wrote the first scene. We wrote all the way up to the walk. And then I had to go do something. And so I texted, I told Joseph, my writing partner, I said, I'm going to go on, a, I'm going to, I think I was going on a walk or something. And I was like, I'm going to go on a walk. I'll be back in an hour and we'll finish this up. And we're going to write the walk with Maxine. And at the time we had not decided that she knew yet. And I was on the walk and the whole time I was on the walk, I was like, what is, what is 
what is the thing that she could say? Like, what is the most interesting dynamic we can establish here? So I just want to say, whole- since our our listeners can't like see this, when, as soon as Kyle said that, <laughs> uh, me and Eric, our mouths were agape with surprise. Like, what? That wasn't planned yet? Yeah. Well, so like, and, and while I was on the walk, I, I, my thought was that she would ask Rabbit if she should end up with Bobby. Mm. And like, would Rabbit decide to say, like, yes, or, or, or would she say something like, you know, I'm finally, I'm so happy he's finally found someone or something like that. And then as I was walking, I just stopped. And I was like, she knows. And she's <gasps> oh! always known. And I called Joseph and he answered. And I was like, he's been poorly concealing the same erection since 2012. And Joseph was like, what are you talking about? And I was like, she knows. <laughs> I sounded like I, I was. I sounded like I was in National Treasure. I was like, I've cracked it. Who like, knows? And um, so we uh, we went home. We wrote the scene. And when we got to that line, the you know, I've been here for ten years. You've been here for one night. The question was like, what is the most? What is the thing that she could say to complicate this the most? And and I think like what we ended up with, you know, she says like, we're happy. And so it's tough because it's like Bobby is doing an objectively dishonest thing yeah and then when you realize that she is too it's tough to like it's tough to it's tough to want better for either of them and it's also tough to feel bad for either of them but it's also tough not to feel sympathy it's just such like a deeply like like uh it's it's a it's one like tightly pulled knot uh you know i and um I'm so glad that's the choice we settled on was like her knowing all along. <laughs> and one of the things that's interesting is once you watch the episode with the context that everybody knows, like everybody's pretending, mm-hmm. all the dinner party stuff gets so ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Yeah, that's really hilarious. <laughs> well, her being like, I would never, not in like 10 years, is yeah. her being like, settle down, Bobby. <laughs> The 10 years line is like especially funny because he's said it's mm-hmm. been 10 years. Mm-hmm. I also love the line where like Bobby's explaining how what like the dynamic and he mentions casually that he's been doing it for 10 years. And yeah. Rabbit's like, did you say 10 years? Yeah, I mean, like we assume Bobby's like 25. That means since he was 15, he's been doing this. Yeah, you gotta um, cut the guy some credit for sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's Bobby is definitely one of the more complex characters i think i've ever written and and ted adds so much depth to him by playing him so smug um, yeah yeah and it's i it really like so you said the original option was that he was going to be like kind of this nerdy character who didn't really have a lot of confidence in himself and i think that choice to play him with that smugness like yeah. it really helps with the kind of the dynamic arc that it takes you on where you really don't like him at first and then you're like whoa like it makes that much more dynamic it's yeah, and it's interesting too. Is like Ted always f- figures out what choice to make to really like broaden things. Uh, he's he's so good at finding a little nuance where there like wasn't some before. Mm-hmm. And you know, originally in the script, that line where he's like, "It's internalized homophobia." It's like it's not if you're not gay, motherfucker. He goes, "It's internalized, internalized homophobia." In the script, it says Bobby averts his eyes ashamed and says like, "It's internalized, internalized homophobia." And Ted just like for the first rehearsal delivered it straight and like, like like as if it's like some like great realization like some some genius thing he's worked up and we were just like we we like we like burst into like laughter because it's it's so much funnier if he's proud of that yeah yeah <laughs> uh, like the amount of pride that this character takes in in his situation is is insane it's absurd <laughs> yeah oh my god that's that's one of the funniest like lines let's let's go through some of the other like really great moments here i love the um <laughs> it's a really interesting star it just answers the phone what's your sexual orientation <laughs> yeah and it's interesting that he he's a little cagey about that like yeah he- well it, the thing too is that you know like i definitely um there's sort of this whole running thing throughout the show where you're not allowed to answer personal questions like, mm-hmm. like neither rabbit nor dispatcher are allowed to share personal details. And um, so that one out of the gate, which I think to rabbit is maybe like the most personal detail. I think he's like really thrown by that. And I love <laughs> how hot comes in. Like, what's your sexual orientation? Like, just like right off the bat. Yeah, and kind of funny with like, well, if we're breaking this rule, he counters with what's your sexual orientation? Yeah. He was like, as long as we're getting it all out there. 
And then he replies, money, hangs up the phone. Yeah, which you said was improvised by the actor. Yes, yes. Uh, cool moment. Uh, originally, the way that the, the scene ended was um, Rabbit goes, what's your sexual orientation? He says, no personal questions. And Rabbit goes, it's for work. Uh, but <laughs> dispatch just like, <laughs> money, put it down. I was like, great job, Ken, we're moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in the moment, did you laugh or were you just like so caught off guard and you're like, wait, that is good? It's interesting. In Rabbit, because we're moving at the pace we're moving, there's no time to break ever. You're not like, 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 there's only one blooper in the entire series. And it's actually in this episode. The one blooper is when uh, we're in the kitchen and uh, Rabbit goes, like, Do you guys sleep over? And he goes, Yes. And Rabbit goes, I see. And he goes, It's excruciating. In that moment, Ted looked into my eyes and I like, bur I, 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 I broke harder than I've ever broken my entire life, I think. Because it's funny too, because like, Ted and I went to school together and we, we like have known each other for like so long and we're so close. We like, you know, we like vacation together every year and everything. I have seen Ted act hundreds of times. I have never acted face to face with Ted. That's wild. Because that's just how like the school situation work we never got paired together for scenes we were in plays together but our characters never interacted and having the first thing that we filmed was that kitchen scene and it was so dissonant because like i've never had like the full force of like this dude i know like acting at me and you know i for, for whatever reason that line broke me so hard <laughs> it is so funny like just that whole kitchen scene the um <laughs> Yeah, we'll jump around a bit. I have these things written down, but we'll just go in order of the things, things as they come totally. up. Totally. But uh, that it's internalized, internalized homophobia. <laughs> it's so funny. And it also is really funny how you're like, you're kind of homophobic, which is so funny. He's been he's been playing gay for 10 years and he's very homophobic. Yeah, no, it's 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 interesting too, because like Bobby was such a weird character to write. Because, like, on some level, Bobby doesn't know he's not gay because he's done this for 10 years. But he is so, like, deeply problematic. And, like, he is so much, like, he's such a, like, entitled type of dude. You yeah. know, like, I think you really get that when he's like, I would prefer it if you did drink. Um, and um, so, like, like, I think the choice that Ted has to play him with that sort of smugness is, like, really, like, lends a lot to that in a big way it's like part of the reason that line lands so well yeah 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 so this kind of ties in with a thing i really wanted to talk about which is that um one thing that i think makes this episode so watchable because i'll admit when i first saw the trailer for this and i'm like oh there's gonna have to be an episode where this guy has to pretend to be gay i i braced myself i was a little yeah. nervous because it's like is that could be a real recipe for disaster um but i think one of the things that really makes it so good is that the protagonist is so clearly not into this idea he's doing it yeah. as a job because he's such a professional but you can tell he's uncomfortable the whole time and he really just doesn't think it's it's right and so having that have having it written with the narrative lens of it's like okay the writers agree with the audience that this is messed totally. up um, totally. And, and, you know, there's just like a big thing that we talked about in college, which is a lot of my writing professors, which is there's a difference between reveling and revealing. So you can tell when a writer is reveling in some sort of problematic behavior, like they're excited that they get to write it into the script and they ex they're excited that they get to, you know, like, like do some, you know, like, like write, you know, problematic characters or, or write problematic behavior. And then there's a difference also between revealing problematic behavior, like showing problematic behavior. And I think like the thing about Rabbit is like Rabbit is kind of our center. So having Rabbit not be into this, and like at the end, sort of exposing Bobby for like what he is, which is a, a, a guy who's been putting on a performance for 10 years that everyone knows is, isn't real. Um, I think it, we, we, we were definitely the most nervous about this episode. Really? Um, yeah, definitely. And um, our, our big thing was like writing every character with as much empathy as we could, you know, even Bobby, uh, even Maxine. And even though they're both doing this sort of awful thing to each other um, and, you know, uh, and, and like giving rabbit those moments to be like, you know, because at the end of the day, like rabbit is rabbit being asexual, like 
I think like he probably does have some sort of like ingrained discomfort with like the the performance that Bobby's taking on. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. It's um and this is another like big picture issue. It's actually really interesting for me to hear you say that one of the first decisions you made was to have uh, Rabbit be asexual because it worked him being asexual, I feel like works so well specifically in this episode that it almost seems like you guys decided to make him or y'all decided to make him asexual because it works so well for the episode. So it's actually cool that that decision came first and it just happens to work so well in this. Totally. There were a lot of other reasons, um, you know, and, and one of the, there are two big ones actually. Um, oh yeah. I'd love to hear was, this. Yeah. Yeah. So w one of them was that um, the show in general is about isolation. Like it's about loneliness and, and you get little, like you get little moments of that, you know, like when rabbits like sitting on the back of his car and he like sighs and it's just kind of that like moment of quiet. Um, and so I think like in a way, like this is another part of like rabbits, like abstraction, you know, like I think like he's, he's not trying to add people to his life sexually and so like it, it 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 you know makes this like this obsession he have with it has with his job like there, there's not like people who he's trying to add to his life that can like potentially pull him out of it um episode five is not out yet um but the, the we sort of open it up when he with with sort of talking about how like rabbit has nothing in his life you know like he's cut everyone out um yeah it's so lonely if your only interactions are these transactional reactions um and someone totally. commented this on your youtube video but like how it's like oh it's really interesting by being just a transactional person in these people's lives he's able to get such a unfiltered um discourse from them but at the same time when it's transactional like that you're not able to form a real bond he probably doesn't see any of these people again totally yeah and um yeah and and it's it's interesting too like uh yeah, people really spill their guts to Rabbit because they know mm -hmm. he's not ever coming back. Um, yeah, and then the the other thing that we thought, like another thing that we just were sort of like, we, we benefit from by making Rabbit asexual is there's so many, so like Rabbit is a criminal and he's kind of a brutal person. Like you see moments like he, in this he talks about having ripped out a dude's fingernails and put them back in. Yeah. And um and, you know, like in the very first episode, we see that he's just brutalized the hell out of some guy. And so, you know, there's a big question to like what Rabbit would do and what Rabbit wouldn't do. And because of the nature of the way we write scenes, there's so many moments in the show in which Rabbit is alone with women. And we never, ever wanted anyone to feel like worried about them. Because, you know, like if Rabbit has no interest in pursuing them, then we can really drop all that kind of related subtext and move and move like straight into the ideological part of the conversation. Um, you know, like if rabbit doesn't want anything from these women that he's engaging with outside of, you know, the, the, the contextual I, I, I ideals he's picking up or whatever, I think it, it, it really like frees us from a lot of like, you know, weird subtext. Yeah, and it allows these amazing women you have in these really great roles to be more than just objects of desire. Totally, totally, yes. I mean, and, and it's interesting, too. I think everybody, when we were premiering the episode, when she was like, I'm going to take your like little boy toy on a walk, everybody, because we had not revealed that a rabbit was asexual yet, everybody was like, they're going to hook up. Like, they're going to hook up, they're going to hook up. There were, like, tons of different things, like, saying they were going to hook up. And I think that's, like, a, I, in my opinion, that would be a much lazier decision than to just reveal that, like, you know, like, there's something more going on with Maxine and Bobby. Um, and so, and, you know, like, I think, like, that was a big thing with the first episode and the second episode is people kept commenting, like, there's so much sexual tension in these scenes. <laughs> and I was like, there's not. <laughs> um, and, and just talking might, quickly. That <laughs> might speak to how much chemistry you have with your acting partners. It's like, I feel like sure. you really have a lot of chemistry with everyone you, you act with. So I could very easily see, yeah, <laughs> Rabbit with any sure. of these people. So, And you, you really get a glimmer of it in the first episode when um, Rabbit breaks this girl's nose and, and he says, and she's asking him to rip off her ears and 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 they're having this conversation and, and he's like everything you do to change yourself makes you less beautiful and she goes you think i'm beautiful and rabbit says well not right now because she's all like her like face is all bloody which is like 
of only I think only Rabbit would respond that way because the thing you should say is yes, you're very beautiful, but Rabbit is just <laughs> like, well, no, not at the moment. Um, you know, we can we can kind of clear out all that, all that you know. Uh, it clears a layer that I think we don't need to make the text work. I think another thing that the show benefits from from having uh, Rabbit be asexual is like Rabbit is already kind of this like impartial judge in these people's lives, almost like someone who comes in and has no agenda other than to do a job. And so also having no romantic, well, actually, I guess uh, we haven't clarified that he's aromantic, but having... Um, no sexual interest in anyone, I feel like, really does uh, add to that impartiality that Rabbit totally. has. Because, uh, yeah, Rabbit takes us, I mean, the director, uh, Max Mikowski, put it in a really nice way. He said, you know, he was like, oh, you know, like, Rabbit's a very deep show. There's a lot going on. But at the same time, we are kind of just meeting a new weird dude every week. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it's true, like, Rabbit is sort of, a, he's, he's sort of like a narrator. He's a little bit of like a watcher. And so, uh, yeah, I think removing like the aspect of like he could possibly want that from somebody could, you know, definitely like remove that like layer of impartiality that he has. Because, um, you know, like Rabbit cares about the job. Like that's that's what it all comes down to. Yeah, clearly. Um, yeah. And so, you, oh, uh, I, I love how you do such a great job of mentioning the people that you work with and giving credit where it's due. That's really, really awesome. And I just want to point out the kind of irony of you working on a show that's about isolation in what sounds like one of the biggest collaborative projects you've ever taken on. Totally. You know, like, I think, like, uh, I wrote this show, like, I, whenever I write anything, I write it about, like, a period in my life. Like, I, I sort of cannibalized the feelings that were involved in that period and, like, the aesthetics that were involved in that period. I love and that. And so, yeah, so for me, Rabbit was, was just about, like, a very, like, lonely period in my life. And it really is remarkable and um, it's, it's crazy that it ended up being a show made by like all my best friends and people who I love. And <laughs> um, you, you know, it's, it's yeah, I, I always say it's a show about loneliness made by all my best friends, um, <laughs> which so is, you cute. know, it's, it's adorable. And, um, and it's nice too, because I, I can sort of like reflect on a different period of my life without like, without feeling like it's, you know, omnipresent are still there because I'm surrounded by so many amazing, beautiful, lovely friends. You're going to make me tear up again. You guys are making me cry on the pod, Kyle. I'm so sorry. It wouldn't be the first time I've cried on the pod. Um, <laughs> so much on the pod. <laughs> That's what pods are for. Well, we're watching all these emotional queer stories and it's just like waterworks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Andrew, you're so hell bent on us having video for this. I'm like, maybe not, Andrew. Don't get video for this. <laughs> I'm just like ugly crying. Um, okay, so we've talked about how the show has benefited from um, the character being asexual, but you also said that there's two reasons you made the, the character asexual. And so the first one uh, you already mentioned to us, did you cover both? Oh, so yeah, the, the second one was, and, and we sort of, we sort of got into this, but it gives us a, a chance to like really dive into the like psychology of like our like female characters a little more, um, which, which like you, you put in a really nice way. It, it, it frees them of being objects of desire. Yeah. Um, which I got to say, I feel like you really dive even deeper into that in the scene with, between um, Maxine and Rabbit, where, um, the line that I really clung to the most was um, when she said, when she was just sort of talking about like how she loves him. And she was just saying that like, knowing this thing, she said something along the lines of like, maybe the way I love him, you're familiar with in regards yeah. to like, the asexual. That line like took me out. I was like, yeah. oh. <laughs> just because I feel like, and it's funny that you say that with, um, in regards to like the people who were predicting that they were going to hook up and just how like, you've stayed one step ahead of the audience this entire, at least for this episode, you said one step ahead. And I feel like it opened up the character of this girl and how she is like, I know the roles that we're all playing here and I yeah. still want to do it because she gets to exist, like she gets to exist in this like fantasy world of existing, like existing outside of the male gaze. She's like, because totally. he is playing this part, like, I know this is what his intent is, but I'm fine with staying in it because it means that, like, I have a barrier between us. And I just totally. think that, like, that 
yeah like you you're just like you open up the world of like the female or like the male gaze with females yeah. and like asexuality it's just, like so many different topics were like hitting like over like the head of the audience and it's just it's such a nice thing it was that was a moment where i was like i'm enjoying this so much well, it's, it's interesting, too, because one of the things we try to do is we try to put Rabbit in the room with a person who he could never possibly understand. And so putting, putting Rabbit in the same room with Bobby is Bobby is the most sexually driven person on the planet. Like he is so obsessed with Maxine. He's been concealing the same erection since 2012. <laughs> and of course, like Rabbit and like can't possibly relate to Bobby on that level. And then when we have this moment where he and Maxine are on the walk and she like, basically she like drops the act and she gets him to drop the act. I think that is a moment where now rabbits in the room with someone who he can connect with, you know, like this moment where they sort of like drop it and they sort of like, let it go. It's like, it's the first time all night rabbit hasn't been pretending. And it's probably the first time she hasn't been pretending in a really long time. So mm. when, we, when we were, when we were looking for a Maxine, that was something that we were really looking for is someone who could really like, like play this sort of like huge amount of fun, you know, that they're having on the wine night and everything. But then when, when they leave, it's sort of, it's, it feels a little bit like it's got this energy of a smoke break, you know, like they're both tired, uh, Maxine, probably more than rabbit. Um, and, mm. and Maya Donato who plays Maxine, does just like a fantastic job of you know, she still has this softness. She's still just so lovely. But at the same time, you can kind of feel in her. She's like, she's like a little ashamed. She doesn't know what to do, but she's like, she's glad to share with somebody. And I feel like for an episode that was centered all around like homosexuality, when then you reveal that none of the characters identify as being gay at all, you still made such a massive commentary on the idea of in existing inside the closet. And like- totally how like having to hide and having to like not reveal your true self and like even like through that like like people who identify as homosexual can still find like the elements to identify within this episode totally and, like and you danced around it yeah like very expertly i feel like th this is the one you know like this is the one we were most nervous about um and i remember one once my writing partner joseph was like it's a I, I, I was like i was like oh i like this one i'm like a little nervous about and he was like you know what I keep having to remind myself is that there are no homosexual people in this episode. Like everybody's doing a play for each other <laughs> and everybody knows that it's not real. Like everybody in the room knows that it's not real. Um, which was, yeah, it was, it was really interesting. And, and this, was a, this was a line that I like wasn't sure about, but we, we, we did end up going with is when Rabbit says, like, why haven't you? And she goes out at him, you know, because like, like Bobby is like in the closet as straight, which is societally like not a thing that you like would expect a person ever to struggle with um, <laughs> although in recent in recent news maybe not yeah <laughs> yeah that's a good point we, um, we talked about that plenty in our last episode so we can move on <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah it's um yeah, it, it was really interesting. You know, it's like, it's, uh, I think an episode that is so much about queerness to involve so few actually queer people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it also like... You, you said there were queer people involved on your team though. I remember you you were like... Oh yeah, no, that. no, yeah, no, totally. I mean, I mean character wise, but yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah. the team is all, you know, all, all it's, you know. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, and I think it's good that like, it's just so funny that you could not decide whether or not Maxine knew. And I feel like there's no other way this episode could exist. Like, totally. Because if she didn't know, then it would be kind of like, ah, uh, like they're sort of like lying to this girl. And like, that's kind of yeah. weird. But like, since everyone sort of knows, it's like, oh, okay, no, like this is. I, it was just like you handled it very well. You did a very good job. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, that, yeah, that, it was. Go ahead. I was just say that's a really good point. You might lose a lot of sympathy for Rabbit if Maxine didn't know, and he just wiped his hands of it and let that continue to exist. So totally. Yeah. Well, you know, because there we would have had the question because we have a rule, and and the rule in the writers' room so far is that Rabbit always accomplishes his mission. But nice. sometimes it comes at some humongous personal cost. And, you know, the personal cost here for, for Rabbit is that he's, he's sort of leaving Bobby 
and Maxine in this in this cycle that they can't break. And um, I like so much more that Rabbit has to do that to Bobby instead of having to do that to Maxine. Yes. Because yeah. Bobby's such an unsympathetic character, you know? And, and, and I think like he really does earn a lot of points back with his monologue, but we're still living in that moment of like, uh, you know, like <laughs> tough. it's tough, you know? <laughs> All right, so I have to ask y'all, if you were in Rabbit's shoes, would you say something? Mm, I don't think I would. <laughs> I mean, I feel like Rabbit hit it on the head in the kitchen when he's like, I'm doing, like, the whole line he said about, like, I'm doing what, like, I'm being paid to do. Like, yeah, it's like, I'm here for money. And unfortunately, yeah. money is the driving force in our everyday life. So yeah. I wouldn't say anything. Yeah. I, I think I think it's t Maxine really complicates it so much. Like, I think if she hadn't said that, it, but she's like, I've been here for 10 years. Like, it's it's just yes, really at the end of the day, it's just, it's just not his place, which is like, I think what he's realizing at the end. And you can kind of see it's, it's not really fully evident, just like in the way that we shot the scene. Um, but like... When she's like, oh, like, I always hoped you'd find someone like this. Like, Rabbit isn't having fun anymore. You know, he's just sort of standing in the back with his arms crossed because, like, now it's, like, clear to him that she's sort of, like, a little bit toying with Bobby. And now I think he's sad because he knows there's nothing he can do. Yeah, the, when he's putting on his gloves at the end, there's something about that that's just, like, it's almost like you can see in his head what's happening he's like i just gotta job is done gotta go it's like that it's such a cinematic visual like mm. totally and and you never really see rabbit without the gloves and you know he takes them off to be jeff but i think like in that moment putting them back on it's a moment of him being like ah yes it's me and then it's also everybody else like it's not me and everybody else it's me but with the gloves on, there's like this this added separation that he has. Wow. I never thought of it like that. Like a physical representation of this barrier he's kind of built between him and everyone around him. Totally. Um, yeah. And, and you know, like we only ever see him without the gloves once. And that's when he's in the bath. And that's because we couldn't think of a... <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we thought about having the gloves on in the bath. But then we were like, you know what? Maybe not. Um, but, you know, like I, I really do think it is like a very like palpable like visual thing which is just that like rabbit is separated like there's a layer of clothing between him and everybody in the world and, and there's something to be said about like when you're in the bath i mean that kind of is a moment when you are more vulnerable than usual anyway so like that, yeah. that still tracks with the metaphor um oh just to answer my own question i i feel like i feel like you hit it on the head uh, when you said that like it's kind of the price he has to pay for doing his job because I feel like in the moment I'd be like I need time to think this over before I do anything and then I I feel like I would like it would keep me up at night just like that decision uh, if anything I'd have to go back later and do it but it's like oh god what a it's such a good moral quandary like the um, trolley problem move aside we have a new one <laughs> <laughs> would you tell Mac would you tell Bobby I think yeah, it's interesting, too, like, about this, you know, you're saying, like, it would probably keep him up at night. It's interesting. We, we had a lot of conversations about, like, the addiction angle of the show. And, and there was a thing where, you know, like, if you want to make it fully through the 12 steps, one of your steps is make amends. And the idea about the oh. fact that, like, if Rabbit keeps doing his job, he'll never, he's like, he's, he's, he's this sort, it's sort of Sisyphean in the sense where he can never completely make amends because he he adds more to his list every single day but you know like to make amends like he like to truly make amends he, he'd have to go back and see bobby and he'd have to see everybody who he like beats the shit out of you know yeah i, I, I would in for me at least in a dream world rabbit gets picked up for a tv series you get like seven seasons you do all new tasks like every season and then the one that one task that you revisit is this one and like whether we've, they know or not i don't know we've, but i'm like we've talked like we we made the whole like uh we made a what's it like a, an outline 
you know, like when, when you're pitching, you need an outline for what the whole show would look like. And the idea was like, ordinarily, there are people who we would see once and then we never see again. But the thought was, I was like, I kind of do want to come back to Bobby at some point. <laughs> like, please, please. That would be so the, interesting. The thing, too, is also like, I'd love to see Bobby in like five years. Like, I'd love to see like what Bobby's getting up to, like, you know, as as time goes on. Um, it's interesting, you know, because like I think sort of the client of the week thing is that you just drop him off and you never see him again. And then we always wonder. But I think like Bobby's someone who I'd like to see again. And um, I'd also like to see the criminologist in episode two again, because she's such an interesting foil for Rabbit, I think morally. I really want Rabbit to make a friend. <laughs> and I know that's yeah. like, like right now it's about isolation, but like totally. I would love to to see like a growth trajectory of like, oh, because he's, he's such yeah. a good guy. He needs a friend. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 thinking. tough too because. Yeah. So go, go ahead. Uh, I just was gonna say I was like I really feel like he made a friend mm. in Maxine, and so that's why I'm like I want you to revisit mm. this just because I'm like I'm sure this conversation that she had with Rabbit, like even her saying it, like I would love to you revisit her and see like how that conversation sort of shaped her viewpoint on this little situation she's in. Like, totally and uh, i just want and it <laughs> also like there's something interesting in the way that maya plays it when she's like are you a prostitute like she says it with such little judgment mm. and he says no and she says oh you're an actor and he says sure kind of and she says why do you do this and you know it's interesting in episode two rabbit says i don't i don't answer personal questions but with maxine he says i'm asexual and i'm an addict which is two humongous things to share with someone and, you yeah. know, like, it's interesting. It's like, on some level, while playing that, my thought was like, this is really the first time he's gotten to open up probably in a very long time. Um, but yeah, you know, like the nature of it is like, I think it's hard to maintain that relationship now that, you know, they're still in this weird ass co codependent relationship. Yeah, and also how sad, how tragic that, like, the one person Rabbit's been able to get closest to is doing this terrible thing that Rabbit clearly objects to on a moral level. Totally. And, and you know, it's interesting, too, like, the thing about the no personal questions is so that, like, Dispatch can keep Rabbit at arm's length. But, like, clearly Rabbit, like, wants to talk about some shit, you know? Like, he's, <laughs> he's trying to work through some stuff. So Dispatch is the real bad guy here. <laughs> Uh? <laughs> um so i want to go back to the the two big things you said about rabbit is that he is asexual and he's an mm -hmm. addict um and those are that's really interesting territory to tread out into um and i think it's obviously great because it's it's really good to represent that but um and i feel like it sounds like it's coming from a pretty informed place so i was curious how did you go about making sure that you wrote about what could be these sensitive manners in a way that was um, informed? Did you do research? Did you talk to people? Walk me through Totally. That. So the, the, here, so Rabbit as a character kind of feels like my, uh, my, in a sense, like my, my super ego, like the, the, the part of my brain that second guesses is where I write Rabbit from. You know, like I have characters who I've written who are kind of my id, who are like plot machines. They're go, go, go and everything. And Rabbit is so deeply existential and he's so curious and he's, he's you know, he's very nervous. And, and he's also, you know, he's, he's also, uh, and like, but the, the problem is I don't think that's a part of him that anyone he interacts with is really interested in. You know, like Bobby's not interested in the moral, the moral side of things, like the, the existential crisis that this is giving Rabbit. And Dispatch isn't interested in any of the, you know, um, so that part of Rabbit is, is, is so much of me. And so for, for the, you know, asexuality, the addiction element of it, we decided that, and this is sort of the, the, my, my process in general as a writer is I will never write about anything unless someone on the team uh, identifies in that way or has dealt with that experience specifically so that you can write from a place of like true knowledge snaps for that wow that's really cool um like i i, I definitely 
wouldn't I, I wouldn't have written rabbit as, asexual unless there were like unless I knew asexual people to talk to about it and you know I, I I wouldn't have tried to conquer like the addiction angle of it if there weren't people I could talk to because like there's such delicate identities like there's they're so they're so specific and and um truly there's such a specific culture involved and there and you just have to be able to do those things in the right way um so you know it's it's oftentimes and, and i learned this like during quarantine i was writing this like tv show and it wasn't to be put on tv i was just writing it all the time because i i wanted to learn how to write television and so if if there were ever moments in which you know we were talking about like certain elements of sexuality or certain elements of like race or identity in america it was always if you can't you know write this with the aid of someone who does identify this way specifically then you probably shouldn't do it you you, you like you, you, and that's i think that there's a big conversation of like what is your story to tell what's not your story to tell and i think you're allowed to tell a story if you are doing it from a place of like actual understanding and knowledge but i think anything i think i think outside of that sometimes it can be a dangerous thing you know and you see that a lot with network stuff where like network stuff is like, let me like, oh, like I'll put in, uh, you know, like a, I'll put in a character who identifies in a specific way because it'll really get that audience on our side. But it's let's, let's use they... gay as an example for the podcast. Sure. Yes, yeah. Totally. Here, here's a gay character. This is yeah, like, good. <laughs> it's like straight 50 year old men writing gay characters and sometimes not even casting gay actors. <laughs> and, you know, mm. like just mm. it's and and like that's because like you know on some level like a network is run like a business and it's 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 run like a like there's a, there's a, some statistics involved and they're like great well this is what people like like pe people want diversity let's just you know throw this out there but if it's not if it's not meaningful if it's not intentional and and you're not writing it from a place of like true understanding then you get into dangerous territory of of like stereotyping or or you know writing about something that you don't understand yeah and in, at some level, slight misrepresentation is better than no representation, but it does also mm -hmm. come with its own issues of like, because that's part of why we started this podcast. We've seen ourselves as gay people misrepresented on screen enough times where it's like, you're, you're excited to see a story about yourself and then you watch it and you're like, this isn't, this isn't right, you know, and there's like a certain danger there. And yeah, um, but also... The other side of that is we are never saying that people who don't identify in a certain way can't write those characters. And I think, um, like, as you said, it's like what really matters is, is there someone on the team who identifies that way? Or are you consulting the right people? You know, we've read some really great stories written by people who aren't gay men, who uh, that are about gay men and they're done really well. So it's like, but just getting it right is so important. And especially when you're in, as you said, like the um, dealing with identities that people really care about and feel connected to or, or are sensitive. Um, totally. You... And it's, I mean, it's, to me, it feels like it's the, it's the highest pressure moment because it matters to people, you know, like it, it matters in a big way. And so like, especially, especially with the asexuality element of Rabbit's character, you know, like this is, this is a group of people who have almost never seen themselves represented. So like making sure it was coming from a place of like, true understanding was was so important because that's the one thing you really don't want to get wrong yeah and so you said you've had some messages from people who are asexual have you also had messages from people who are addicts or were yeah, addicts? It's, yeah totally and and um you know it's it's that's that's a really interesting aspect of it too um you know uh the the history of addiction in my family is is long and uh storied and um I, I've, I've had so many interesting conversations with people afterwards. Um, there's a moment in, uh, in episode four where Rabbit says like, you know, to Toad, his sort of like, you know, darker half says like, I know I'm a degenerate. Why don't you? And Rabbit says, well, you know, like I'm a recovering addict. I have to believe that all people can overcome. And he doesn't, he, he, he's not even saying he believes all people can overcome. He's saying, I have to believe that all people can overcome. Like that's, that's like the, the mantra that I think like he's chosen and, you know, the, the tenacity is, is, is at the core of that character. And I think that's something you only get by like breaking addiction, by like being able to like fight something that is so omnipresent and so difficult in your life. 
And um, I think that moment in the show was one that a lot of people really connected with. Um, was like that moment in which you realize like, you get a real glimpse into like why rabbit does this and why he is the way he is. Because like for him, like human willpower is like the only thing that, that, that he's been able to depend on. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing that like personal detail. That's, that's really empowering. And that's really cool that people have felt connected to your writing in that way. I mean, that's, that's really powerful. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the most remarkable part of the process. And, 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 you know, like, when, when people are like, oh, we love the show, it's like, hell yeah. You know, but when someone's like, I haven't seen myself it before, you know, and this is it, you know, like, like that is such a greater and more overwhelming feeling. Um, and uh, you, we're, we're, we're just glad that people, you know, people feel like it was done correctly or, or handled well, you know. Yeah, when you made this, you thought maybe you'd be making something on an iPhone that no one would watch. And totally. to, you have this totally. major following and people reaching out, being I finally feel seen. Like, wow, what a what a crazy black and white between what you possibly expected and and what you got. That's so cool. It's it's crazy because you know, like on a certain level, like there's there's a lot of like really great writing reasons to make rabbit asexual, and there's a lot of like really like but I wasn't sure how many people would see this and the fact that like, you know, it's, it's not a humongous audience, but it is an audience and, and a particular portion of it is people who are uh, identifying as asexual, but also people who are like seeing it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of moving the goalposts forward a little bit. I think like that is, that's more than I could have ever expected. And, and is is, I think it, to me, the coolest part about it. Uh, yeah. And, and the, like the people that do, I feel like the people that are fans of you, Kyle, are really diehard fans. Like mm. your, um, what you may, what, I mean, I'm not going to say you lack in breadth cause you don't, but <laughs> you, you <laughs> called it limited audience, but it's like, sure. I feel like the people who follow you, like you really connect with people in a really strong way, which is extremely cool. Yeah. I, I think a big part of that too is, um, you know, I, I never monetized TikTok. Like I don't make any money from it. I'm not in the creator fund. I don't, oh. uh, I don't run ads. And so I think in doing that and like, actually like, you know, like I like got a job and I was like, okay, like this will be a thing that I do because it's fun. And this will be a thing that I do because like, I like making stuff. It kept me out. It kept me from ever like, you know, trying to like sell toothpaste or whatever. And, <laughs> and like, you know, like being like Enron, you know, like, uh, you know, like it, it kept me from, I think, like breaking this connection of like creation and trust with my audience. And so like, I, I'm not one of those people who blew up really quickly. Like it happened just like over time in increments. And I think that like, because of that, like my audience and I have like, I think like maybe like a certain understanding that, you know, like it's, uh, it's something that I'm like making for both of us. Um, you know, like as, as much as rabbit is for everybody, like rabbits for me too. Like I get to watch a show that I'm in. Like that's, that's <laughs> the greatest thing ever. Uh, and you're making me cry again. Stop uh, it. Uh, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, what speaking like, so I'm hoping your fans will listen to this and, uh, they probably want to know more about you and I do too. So I'm really curious. So one, you mentioned that every character has something that they want to be and something they're afraid of being. Would you be able to tell us what that is for Rabbit? Yes. Uh, so for Rabbit, Rabbit hopes he is like a folk hero. Like he's sort of this like, you know, like uh, he comes into people's lives and he, you know, he's, he's Johnny Appleseed. You know, he's, he's <laughs> Robin Hood. I, I think, yeah, yeah. Robin Hood is probably perfect. Um, yeah. Rabbit hopes he's Robin Hood. And I think Robert, Rabbit fears that he is uh, a thug, like he's mm. he's hurting people for money, and it's what makes his interactions with Toad so interesting because Toad hopes he's a thug, and hopes he's an irredeemable criminal, and he fears that he is redeemable because if he is redeemable, you have to work, you have to make changes, and so having these two characters with such completely and absolutely opposite belief systems like really pushes them against each other in a lot of interesting ways and it's it's tough too because like when, when you when the slogan is you pay we do and rabbit has to show up and and you know do things that he's not proud of like how do you 
how do you still consider yourself, you know, Robin Hood? Yeah, that's really fascinating. And then so tying that to you, I feel like you've already mentioned that rabbit is kind of like this manifestation of a specific part of your brain, specifically your super ego, the part of you that's sure. worried about morals and ethics and stuff. And so, yeah, how how much of rabbit is written in your voice in your like, how do you relate to this character? And are there any specific moments where you're like, oh, this is this is definitely me? I yeah, definitely. I mean, I think when you write something, every character is you unfortunately um you know like every single one of these characters is is on some level like uh, a mix of me joseph johnston and then the actor um and and for rabbit i think that the thing that i like specifically relate to is that like that like uh that piece of him that is like i need to get through like i need to like like by the sheer force of my will i can change things um you know and and uh I, and i i think like that i i do you know when this will come out will it be uh, after sunday yeah 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 there is a moment in the show where rabbit says the most valuable thing a person can possess is tenacity and like i i he like deeply like believes that and um i'm not sure if that's what i believe but i really do relate to that in him the idea that like he's like I could push through no matter what, um, and that's really where I find find the way into this character. It could because that's something that you dealt with before. Totally, totally. I mean, and like I think I was having this conversation today with Ted Gibson who plays hey. Bobby. <laughs> but um, there's a John Mulaney quote where he's like, "Life will always get better. It always does, and life will always get worse. It always does." And, you know, it's, it's, it's constant waves and it's ups and it's downs. And I think like, um, uh, a, a specific, like, like you have to carry on, you know, like you don't have a choice. Um, and I, and I, and I'm sure that's something in a big way that like your audience can relate to, um, you know, like the, the, you know, the, the idea of like, you know, like pushing through times in which you don't feel like yourself. And you don't feel like you're, you're, you're like being who you are. And, um, you know, for me, like the, the, the thing that I love about rabbit is the fact that like nothing will stop him. And I, and I hope to like embody that quality, you know? I love that. That's such a beautiful message. And also congratulations to yourself. If it sounds like you were <laughs> in a spot like that, where you had to have that mentality and you got through, um, I feel like I can say the same for myself and it's, it's a inspirational yet realistic message. Like things will totally. get better, things will get worse. And just like knowing that having the fortitude, you can get through that. I think that's such a beautiful note. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, it's weird. You know, I, I, there, I have written a character before who I was like, this is kind of me. And, and to me, rabbit a little bit feels like a son, like in a weird way, I'm like, <laughs> which is, which is sad because I put him through so many horrible things. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, you know, like, I really do have, like, this, like, weird feeling of, like, 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 you know, like, sympathy for him all the time. Um, and, and you know, it, it isn't yet, but it, it, it is, it will be at some point, I think, like, a show about, like, deciding to get better. Um, and, and, you know, I think that that's, that's where it's going. And that's what I hope for Rabbit and for all people. Hell yeah. A beautiful note and a nice sneak peek of what we can maybe expect for future, future sure. stories. Eric, did you have anything else you want to mention before we go into our final thoughts? Mm, no, I think I'm just, I'm crossing my fingers. Y'all get picked up for, <laughs> I want more. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. yeah. What a beautiful note to end on. So uh, we like to go through Kyle and say some, oh, wait, no, I forgot. While we're talking about you, um, I had asked if anyone had any questions I should ask you and oh, really? I got one and I almost forgot to ask it. I would have kicked myself so hard. Um, uh, what's something new you learned this week? Oh, I, I actually, okay. Um, so I live in Los Angeles and uh, when you live in Los Angeles, every single person you talk to works in entertainment. <laughs> so the conversation I had recently was uh, how many people in Los Angeles actually work in entertainment? What percentage? uh do, do you guys have any guesses Ooh, ooh, 70 percent 
64. Even 70 seems high. It's got to be like, it can't be over 50, can it? It can't. It's 2%. Only 2%? It's, you it's, are it's actually, lying. <laughs> it's actually, it's actually, it's actually one point eight percent because I, I found out and I immediately started like I was like no 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 way, and I think it's you know it's it's really interesting because I was like wow I am really really wrapped up in my bubble, but yeah two per, or one point eight percent of people who live in LA are in entertainment. That's something I learned recently that I was just blown away by because I feel like everybody I know is a you know a, a COVID PA or a podcaster <laughs> is that like okay are we are we factoring in like the people who have yet to break into this industry so, who still so are that's living the, there? Th this is this is what it is it's employed in entertainment so mm. well, i guess we're not counting hopefuls which is i think i think we're uh, uh, sort of 50 percent <laughs> yeah yeah 50%, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah totally uh so um my final thoughts are that, uh, Kyle, you're a huge inspiration. You're so cool. And it's Thank so you. nice of you to be on this podcast. And um, I think that this show is <laughs> uh, does so much better than the last piece of media I saw that where someone had to pretend to be or someone pretended to be gay for a girl, which was kick ass. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's like, oh, um, anyway, but this is such great representation. And it's also just a really good story and something we can really connect to and then on a bigger scale the way you connect to your fans and make stuff with such intention is really inspirational and i really i think that's really great thank you thank you guys so much for having me this was really fun <laughs> eric do you have any final thoughts you want to give um uh, i just want to say i love what you said about when you're like serving like communities that you're trying to represent and how like you can do that if you're trying to genuinely understand it. And I just, and I just, I think Andrew has been hitting this on the head the entire episode, but you just come from such a genuine place of telling stories and it just shows through your work, how much you love this thing that you do. And yeah, like I'm excited to outside of the podcast and talking about like representation. I'm just, I'm so excited to continue to see what you do and like, what comes from rabbit what other projects you do i just know that you're gonna like have such a genuine love for it and like gonna make good only good stuff thank you so much i appreciate that yeah i i i, I do it because it's fun you know like it's it's the same thing with with everything you know like i i don't have ads on rabbit i'll never i'll probably for a long time never make any money off it but it's <laughs> it's you know it's the greatest well, thank you so much. Do you have anything, uh, obviously, Rabbit Web Series, anything else you'd like to promote for us on the podcast? That's it. Watch Rabbit. That's the only <laughs> thing that matters right now. You love it so much. It's actually really endearing. It really is like a son to you. That's so cute. Yes, yeah, it's, it's my boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kyle, thank you so much for being on the pod. You are welcome back anytime. You're absolutely fantastic. We had such a good time with you, and I really, really appreciate you being on this with us. Thank you guys for having me. I feel like Andrew, normally, Kyle, we end the pod chanting gay, gay, gay. But I feel like we should end the pod chanting ace, ace, ace. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Hell yeah. Ace, 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 ace. From a loving ally, we love you asexual. <laughs> All right, have a good night, everyone.